Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next two hours. First, we'll have a reading from the book, Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness, and then an hour of discussion. Last time, we concluded on page 30 of the book. Tonight, we'll retreat about one paragraph and begin reading uh, for continuity purposes. And currently, we are discussing Daniel's prophetic foreview of Romanism, the prophet Daniel's prophetic foreview or prediction of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. Yes, the little horn of Daniel is speaking specifically of the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Now we'll begin the reading. Ere long, Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation, arose, and at last came the blessed movement itself with Martin Luther and the rest of the Reformers, which delivered Germany, England, and other lands from the papal yoke, dividing Christendom into two camps, Romanist and Protestant. Vainly did Rome seek with frantic efforts to arrest or reverse this movement. That's right, Rome did everything within her power, including inquisitions and wars to defeat the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation proclaimed the papacy was the little horn of Daniel, the son of perdition, the man of sin, the biblical prophetic antichrist of the Bible, as did the the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. And Rome, wishing to silence that movement, which is Protestantism, that's what we're protesting, the papacy, Rome wanted to put down that protest and hide any discussion about Daniel and Paul 
and John's description of the papacy. Again, he says, vainly did Rome seek with frantic efforts to arrest and reverse this movement. Speaking of the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant movement. And he says, hecatombs of martyrs, oceans of blood, centuries of wars could not stop it. At the beginning of the 16th century, Rome boasted that not a single heretic, that is, a Protestant, not a single heretic could be found. Now, Christendom contains 150 millions of those whom the papacy calls heretics and whom it would exterminate by fire and sword if it could. It did succeed in crushing out the Protestant Reformation movement in France, excuse me, France, Spain, and Italy by lawful, uh, by awful, excuse me, by awful inquisition tortures, by bloody massacres, by cruel wars, by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, by the deeds of such men as Philip of Spain and his Armada, and the Duke of Alva and his cruelties in the Netherlands. Rome recovered some of the ground she had lost in the Protestant Reformation, and she still exercises spiritual power over 180 millions of mankind. Though her temporal power was overthrown for a time in the French Revolution, and to the joy of Italy brought brought to an end in 1870, her claim to it is in no wise abated nor her pretension that she has a right, a divine right, to rule the world. The religion of Rome has so disgusted the continental nations that, knowing nothing better, they have drifted into practical infidelity, and with one consent they have to a large extent despoiled the Roman Catholic Church of her revenues, secularized her property and her religious houses, and repudiated her interference in their respective governments. I'll stop right there and comment. That's exactly what needs to be done today. Romanism needs to be once again recognized as the the Antichrist of the Bible, the synagogue of Satan, and then her all of her goods to be despoiled, that and also her, her church revenues and all of her property, her churches and her monks, her, her uh, monasteries and nunneries need to be secularized, in other words, taken from her, and all of her goods be restored to the people who were built out of it by the Roman Catholic Church. And she needs to be, again, once again, repudiated and condemned as the synagogue of Satan and her head, the papacy, once again denounced as Antichrist. That's what the Protestant Reformation movement did. And it liberated all of Europe, at least for a time. But Rome fought back. It's called the Counter-Reformation. And it has been her goal to destroy Protestantism ever since. And the the grandest achievement of the Roman Catholic Church in that effort is Vatican Council II and ecumenism. Okay? And Vatican Council II and ecumenism, the reunion of all the world's religions under one ecclesiastical head, could not have happened were it not for futurism. The idea that prophecy teaches about a future Antichrist that comes at the last seven years of time before Christ's return, when in fact, in biblical, historical, and prophetic fact, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. And because Christians no longer believe that because they believe in a future Antichrist, they believe in futurism, we have brought upon ourselves another counter-reformation in the United States of America. Rome is going to act on our ecumenical mindset 
and she's going to use the government of the United States to overthrow God's people in this country. The protestants, those who protest the papacy as antichrist, and who protest the beast upon which she rides, the governments of the world. Now, continue with the text. It says this is about where we concluded last time in the book, uh, on in our last session. He says, for the last 500 years, the authority of the papacy has been declining, quote, slowly and silently receding from their claims to temporal power. The pontiffs hardly protect their, uh, their dilapidated citadel from the revolutionary concussions of modern times, the rapacity of governments, and the growing aversion to ecclesiastical influence. Those who know what Rome has once been are best able to appreciate what she is. Now, you and me know what Rome has been and what she is today. The same as she's always been. The the scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17. Continuing now, he says, those who have seen the thunderbolt of the hands of the Gregories and the innocents will hardly be intimidated at the sallies of decrepitude, the important, the, the impotent dart of Priam amid the crackling ruins of Troy, unquote. So wrote Henry Hallam in his early part of this century, in the early part of this century. And while the fall of the temporal power has since taken place and carried to low watermark that steady ebb tide of papal influence, which he alleges, yet there has been during the last half century a revival of Romish influence in Protestant nations, which Hallam probably did not expect. And I expect that most Protestants did not expect it. And now Romanism has grown to the same power and influence in the world today that it had in the Dark Ages, okay, in the old world order. And I want to, I want to reiterate, as monotonous and redundant it is, as it is, I want to remind you once again, The new world order is simply the old world order restored. There's nothing new about it at all. And we can vividly recognize what's happening in the world today as being consistent with what Rome did in in the old world order. This new world order should not be a mystery to anybody who has a competent understanding of history and the Bible, particularly prophecies and particularly this prophecy of Daniel about the Roman Catholic Church, the little horn of Daniel. Now, he concludes here with this paragraph. He says, I must not pause to estimate the causes or the importance of this revival here, but shall have occasion to allude to it again later on. Let me now propose to you a puzzle. It is to condense into some brief, simple sentences, which could be read in a few minutes, an accurate, comprehensive, graphic summary of the 1,300 years of papal history. Hallam's history of Latin Christianity is here on the table. It occupies nine octavo volumes and would take weeks to read. Ranke's History of the Popes is in three volumes and does not cover the whole subject. De Bigny's History of the Reformation is in five volumes and takes up only one episode of the long story. The papacy has existed for 13 centuries, has had to do with 40 or 50 generations of mankind in all the countries of Christendom. Its history is consequently extremely complicated and various. It embraces both secular and ecclesiastical matters. Why? Let me ask. Let me ask the question. Why does it embrace and concern both secular and ecclesiastical matters? That is, worldly matters or civil matters, and 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 ecclesiastical or church matters. Because in the old world order, church and state were united. So in order to understand anything about the ecclesiastical authority of the Roman Catholic Church, 
you have to understand its secular authority. And history is literally dripping with example after example after example of how the the kings of the earth kowtowed to the papacy and did the church's bidding. And it led to slaughters of hundreds of millions of God's people. Again, he says, it embraces both secular, that is state, and ecclesiastical, that is church, matters and has more or less to do with all that has happened in Europe since the fall of the old Roman Empire. The time was long. The sphere is vast. The story exceedingly complex. I want to tell it all, in outline at least, in a narrative that you can read in less than five minutes or write in ten. You must bring in every point of importance the time and the circumstances of the origin of the papacy, its moral character, its political relations, its geographical seat, its self-exalting utterances and acts, its temporal sovereignty, and a comparison of the extent of its dominions with those of the other kingdoms of Europe, its blasphemous pretensions, its cruel and long-continued persecutions of God's people, the duration of its dominion, its present decay, and the judgments that have overtaken it. And you must moreover add what you think its end is likely to be and explain the relations of the whole story to the revealed plan of divine providence. You must get all this in, not in the dry style of an annual time summary of the the events of the year, but in an interesting, vivid, picturesque style that will impress the facts on the memory so that to forget them shall be impossible. Can you do it? I might safely offer a prize of any amount to the person who can solve this puzzle and write this story as I have described. But hard, even impossible as it would be for you to do this, even if you perfectly knew the history of the last 13 centuries, how infinitely impossible it would be if that history lay in the unknown and unscrutable future instead of in the past and the present. I want to stop and tell you that right here, On page 33 of this book, Henry Grattan Guinness has just launched the first attack against futurism because the descriptions in the Bible of the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, all that is written in the Bible could not take place in just seven years of period of time, as is taught in all the churches today. Let me read what he says again. Speaking of this writing, describing Romanism, he says, can you do it? He says, I might safely offer a prize of any amount to the person who can solve this puzzle and write this story as I have described. But hard, even impossible as it would be for you to do this, even if you perfectly knew the history of the last 13 centuries, how infinitely impossible it would be if that history lay in the unknown and and inscrutable future instead of in the past and the present. Okay? I hope my listeners comprehend what he has just told you. Futurism is ridiculous. That's what he just told you. Futurism is impossible, okay? It's just ridiculous. He says, if no eye had seen nor ear heard it, if it was an, in, uh, an, uncon- excuse me, if it was an untraversed continent, an unseen world, a matter for the evolution of ages yet to come, Who then could tell the story at all, much less in brief? 
Now, this is precisely what the prophet Daniel, by inspiration of the omniscient and eternal God, has done. He told the whole story of the papacy 25 centuries ago. He omitted none of the points I have enumerated. And yet the prophecy only occupies 17 verses of one chapter, which can be read slowly and impressively in less than five minutes. This is because it is written in the only language in which it is possible thus to compass multrum uh, in parvo, the ancient language of hieroglyphics. God revealed the future to Daniel by a vision in, in which he saw not the events, but living, moving, speaking hieroglyphs of the events. These Daniel simply describes and his description of them constitutes the prophecy written in the 17th chapter of his book. Excuse me, the 7th chapter of his book. He's speaking of Daniel chapter 7. Our consideration of this remarkable prediction must, however, postpone for the present, as we've already claimed your attention long enough for one lecture. Okay, so with this, Henry Grattan Guinness concludes the first lecture of his series of lectures that form the body of this book. These lectures were given, to, were given to standing room only crowds, crowds that even spilled out into the streets. And in England where these lectures were given, the crowd was uh, encompassed virtually every strata of, civil, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, of the civilization from from the pre priestly house on down to the street sweeper, including the kings and the queens and the, the governing factions of England at the time. Henry Grattan Guinness was one of the most popular preachers of his day. And to, to my notion, he has hardly been surpassed since that time. <clears throat> now, with all that said, I'll continue now with his second lecture. It's entitled The Daniel Forview of Romanism, Second Part. He says, allow me to commence this lecture by reading to you Daniel's description of the divinely designed hieroglyph by which the history of Rome was prefigured. He has previously described the hieroglyphs of the Babylonian, Persian, and Grecian empires and then he says, quote, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the, with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom three, <clears throat> before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery furnace, a fiery flame, and his wheels were burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, quote, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I came near to one of them that stood by and asked him to tell the truth of all this. 
So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of times but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Unquote. In these verses, you have the entire story of the papacy. And what is more, you have its future as well as its past, the judgment of God as to its moral character and deserts. And how vivid the coloring, how graphic the picture. I wish I could paint or even better still display in action before your eyes such a dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong wild beast with its brazen claws and iron teeth and ravening, ferocious nature, with its ten horns and its strange head-like little horn, able to see and speak and blaspheme the Almighty, so as at last to bring down destruction on the beast itself. I wish I could let you watch it rending and tearing its enemies, breaking their bones in pieces, devouring their flesh in a wanton, fierce ferocity, stamping on and trampling with its brazen, clawed feet what it cannot consume. If you had learned the ABC of the language of hieroglyphs, you would at once recognize that such creatures as this are figures of godless empires kingdoms which are brutal in their ignorance of God, in their absence of self-control, in their bestial instincts, which love bloodshed and are reckless of human agony, selfish, terrible, cruel, and mighty. They represent, the recall, they represent and recall proud military heroes like Julius Caesar, who trampled down all that opposed them, cruel despots who oppressed their fellows, reckless conquerors like Tamerlane and Napoleon, to whom the slaughter of millions of mankind was a matter of no moment. This is the genetic signification of all such hieroglyphs. But we are not left to guess the meaning and application of this particular monster. The symbol has a divine interpretation. Quote, the fourth beast, we read, 
shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, unquote. That, beyond all question, was Rome. As all historians agree, the fourth and last of the great universal empires of antiquity. The monster represents Rome. Her whole existence as a supreme or ruling power after the fall of the Greek or the Macedonian beast before her attacks of BC 197. It represents, therefore, the history of Rome for over 2,000 years in the past and on into a time still future. For be it well noted, this beast ravages and rules and his characteristic little horn blasphemes and boasts right up to the point when empires like to world be uh, like to wild beasts come to an end and quote the son of man and the saints of the most high take the kingdom and possess it forever unquote in other words this roman beast the papacy is going to rule this world and trample God's people until Christ returns. For nearly 2,000 years, Rome has fulfilled her prophetic foreview as seen by the prophet Daniel in the Bible. And if you're looking for a future Antichrist, you have been deceived. Now he continues. It is important that we should clearly grasp one great historical fact, i.e., the rule of Rome has never, since it, since it first commenced, ceased to exist, save once, for a very brief period of time during the Gothic invasion. It has changed in character, as we have seen, but it has continued. Rome ruled the known world at the first advent of Christ and still rules hundreds of millions of mankind and will continue to do so right up until the second advent of Christ. So this prophecy teaches, for not until the Son of Man takes the dominion of the earth and establishes a kingdom that shall never pass away, is the monster representing Roman rule destroyed. The rule of Rome, we repeat, has never ceased. It was a secular pagan power for five or six centuries. It has been an ecclesiastical and apostate Christian power ever since, that is to say, for 12 or 13 centuries. There lay a brief period between these two main stages during which professing Christian emperors ruled from Rome, followed by an interval when, for a time, it seemed as if the great city, Rome, had received a fatal blow from her Gothic captors. It seemed so, but it was not so, for the word of God cannot be broken. The rule of Rome revived in a new form and was as real under the popes of the 13th century as it had been under the Caesars of the 1st century. It was as oppressive, as cruel, and as bloody under Pope Innocent III as it had been under Nero and Domitian. The reality was the same, though the form had changed. The Caesars did not persecute the witnesses of Jesus more severely or bitterly than did the popes. Diocletian did not destroy the saints or oppose the gospel more than did the inquisition of papal days. Rome is one and the same all through, both locally and morally. One dreadful wild beast represents her though the symbol, like the history it prefigures, has two parts. There was the undivided stage, and there has been the tenfold stage. 
The one is Rome pagan, the other Rome papal. The one is the old empire, the other the modern pontificate. The one is the empire of the Caesars, the other is the Roman papacy. I speak broadly, omitting all detail for the present. We shall find more of that when we come by and by to John's later four views. Daniel's was a distant view in the days of Belshazzar, too distant altogether for detail. No artist paints the sheep on the hillside if the hill be 50 miles off. He may sketch its bold outline, but he omits minor detail. So Daniel's distant four view, dating from about 2,500 years ago, shows the two great sections of Roman history, the undivided military empire followed by the Commonwealth of Papal Christendom, the latter as truly Latin in the character as the former. And he shows the end of Rome at the second advent of Christ. But he refrains from encumbering his striking sketch with confusing political details. He does not fail, however, to delineate fully the moral and religious features of the power ruling from Rome during the second half of the story, the power symbolized by the proud, intelligent, blasphemous, headlike little horn of the Roman beast. To this he devotes, on the contrary, the greater part of the prophecy. And I must ask you now carefully to note the various points that prove this horn to be a marvelous prophetic symbol or hieroglyph of the Roman papacy fitting it as one of Chubb's keys fits the lock for which it was made, perfectly and in every part, while it refuses absolutely to adopt itself to any other. That's Henry Grattan Guinness' eloquent way of telling you it's the papacy, and it can't be anybody else. And I will add to it this. Would Christ have any of us, would God have any of us to be confused about who our Messiah is, Jesus Christ? Are not the scriptures vividly portrayal of Christ thousands of years before he ever came? How could we miss him? When it quotes the very words that he would say upon the cross as he was being crucified. And our God does not deal treacherously with his people. The Bible clearly describes Jesus, how he, would re, how he would be born into the world of a virgin, how he would preach and teach and eventually be slain by his own brethren. Those prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. There was no room to forget. And even Daniel, Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, gave no no room for error as to the very date of his arrival. He predicted 490 years until the, until the destruction of Jerusalem. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, it's called Daniel's 70th week. It heralds the arrival of the Messiah. And there were those in Jerusalem, namely Simeon, who was so knowledgeable of the prophecies of Daniel and so led by the Spirit of God that he was literally waiting at the temple to behold the salvation of Israel on the eighth day of his birth when Mary brought him to the temple to be circumcised according to the law. That's just how perfect Daniel's prophecy was of the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, who in his right mind would doubt that God would be just as descriptive about Christ's counterfeit? Why would God be so concerned about us knowing who the Christ is and then caring nothing for our understanding about who the, who the deceiver is? And as we continue to read and discuss this book, you'll discover God does not deal treacherously with his people. And just as much as he wants us to know who our Savior is, he wants us to know who the Antichrist is. 
And that's why Daniel's foreview of the papacy is so vivid, so spot on, so historically perfect in that description that there's just no other candidate for the for the Antichrist but the papacy. Just as there is no candidate for the role played by Jesus Christ, no confusion there, there can be no confusion about his counterpart. And all the churches today teach confusion. They want you to be confused about who Antichrist is. They prefer you not even talk about the Antichrist and the prophecies because they're divisive. What is their agenda? Clearly. Clearly that you be confused also about who the Christ is and eventually receive the Antichrist as Christ in the world. That's the new world order. It's simply the restoration of the old world order. When the papacy was known as the vicar of Christ on this earth, the replacement of Jesus Christ on earth, the blasphemer, that's Rome's entire agenda. That's been her agenda since the very beginning. And the papacy is a perfect fulfillment of Daniel's <clears throat> foreview of the Antichrist. And there is no other. There's no other candidate. We cannot get this wrong. God made it too simple, too vivid, too undeniable. And God has blessed you if you comprehend this. Now we'll continue. The last paragraph on page 41, if you're following along, it says the main points in the nature, character, and actings of this quote-unquote little horn, which we must note in order to discover the power intended, are these. Number one, its place within the body of the fourth empire okay what's the fourth empire first there was Babel, babylonian then the medo persian empire then the grecian empire and the fourth and final empire on the earth before christ return is the roman empire and it was already up and running before jesus christ was born that's why jesus said these are the last days. Okay? And he also said, behold, the kingdom of, the, of God is at hand. What was he saying? Simply reach out and touch me. I am the kingdom. I am the one that's going to defeat this fourth kingdom, this Roman kingdom. But this kingdom that now reigns over the earth, over Jerusalem and over Israel, and who will eventually put me to death on the cross, will continue to rule on the earth and persecute my sons and daughters until I return in wrath to destroy her. So don't think for a minute that this fourth and final empire is not still in control, just as much control or even more control than Rome had during the life of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. Number one, its place within the body of the fourth empire. That's where Antichrist is going to come from, from the body of the fourth empire, the Roman Empire. First, there was pagan Roman Empire, then papal Roman Empire, but it's always been Roman Empire. The United States is as much a fiefdom of the Roman Empire as was Germany, France, and Spain during the old world order. I want you to comprehend this. It's going to take a little bit of unlearning before you can comprehend what Daniel says. Now, number two, the period of its origin. Soon after the division of the Roman territory into ten kingdoms, okay, 
We're talking about that period of time after the old pagan Roman Empire fell. It broke up into ten kingdoms. And then after the establishment of those ten kingdoms, then the papacy stood up in the power vacuum that was left when the Roman Caesar left Rome and went to Constantinople, Emperor Constantine. That's when the old pagan Roman Empire became the new papal Roman Empire. Now, number three, it's nature. Different from the other kingdoms, though in some respects like them. It was a horn, but with eyes and a mouth. It would be a kingdom like the rest, a monarchy, but its kingdom would be, but its kings would be overseers or bishops and prophets. Okay, what's its nature? It's different from all the other kingdoms. Why? Because it's not just a secular power, people. It's an ecclesiastical power too. That's what makes it different from all the other kingdoms before it. It's the what the what the history calls the Holy Roman Empire, the Papal Roman Empire. And trust me, there is not now, nor there has there ever been, nor will there ever be anything holy about it. It is as unholy as you can possibly get. It is the kingdom of Antichrist. That is its nature. Number four. It's moral character, boastful and blasphemous, great words spoken against the Most High. And I'll only give you one example. The papacy demands that the world calls him Holy Father. You can't get more blasphemous than that. His official title in his, in, in his, in his bishop's mitre is Vicar of Christ, that is, replacement of Christ. That's what it means. Can't get more blasphemous than that. Number five, it's lawlessness. It would claim authority over times and laws. The papacy does away with the Ten Commandments of God. If I had the time, I would describe you count by count how the papacy, how the Roman Catholic Church institutionally teaches against the Ten Commandments of God violates every single one of them as a matter of Roman Catholic canon law. Okay? It is lawless, and it changes God's law or does away with them altogether. And it also changes times. And one of the most defining characteristics of the Roman, the papal Roman Empire is that it changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. Sunday, throughout all history, has only been celebrated and venerated by the heathen pagan nations of the world. And Rome adopted it as the Christian Sabbath, doing away with the fourth commandment altogether. That's a matter of official recorded history. In 321 A.D., Emperor Constantine changed the solemnity of Sabbath to Sunday. That's officially recorded in history. It's not to be disputed. His lawlessness, he would claim authority over times and laws. Prophecy fulfilled. Number six, it's opposition to the saints. It would be a persecuting power, and that for so long a period that it would wear out the saints of the Most High, who would be given into its hand for a time. History is dripping with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, and Rome has made herself drunk with that blood. Number seven, its duration. Time times and a half, or 1,260 literal years. Number eight, its doom. It would suffer the loss of its dominion before it was itself destroyed, 
quote, they shall take away its dominion to consume and destroy it to the end, unquote. Here are eight distinct and perfectly tangible features. If they all meet in one great reality, if we find them all characterizing one and the same power, can we question that that is the power intended? They do all meet in the Roman papacy, whose history I have just briefly recalled, and we are therefore bold to say it is the great and evil reality predicted. A few words on each of these points to convince you that this is the case. Number one, the place. No one can question that the papacy is a Roman, as distinguished from a Greek or an Oriental power. Its seat is the seven-hilled city. Its tongue is the Latin language of Caesar and of Pliny and Tacitus. Its church is the Church of Rome and is the only church that is or ever has been named for a, from a city. Others have been named from countries or of men. The papal church alone bears the name of a city, and that city is Rome. The papacy fulfills the first condition, therefore. Number two, the time. We have shown that the last bishop of Rome and the first pope was Pope Boniface III in A.D. 607. Now the Western Empire of Rome came to an end with the fall of Romulus Augustulus in A.D. 476, that is, 130 years earlier. During that time, the ten kings were forming into the body of the old empire, and during that time, the simple pastor of the church was transformed into a pope. The little horn grew up among the ten. The papacy developed synchronistically, or synchronously rather, with the Gothic kingdoms. Number three, its nature. The power symbolized by the little horn is, of course, a kingdom, like all the other ten, but it is not merely this. It is, quote-unquote, diverse or different from all the other ruling dynasties with which it is associated. It is a horn of the wild beast, but it has human eyes and a human voice, denoting its pretensions to be a seer or a prophet or a teacher. It takes the oversight of all ten. It is an overseer or a bishop, and it has a mouth speaking great things. Its paramount influence does not on its entire material uh, uh, does not on its mere material power, for it is small as a kingdom, a little horn, but on its religious pretensions. Does not this exactly portray the papacy? Was it not diverse or different from all the Agothic kingdoms amid which it existed? Was it a mere kingdom? Nay, but a spiritual reign over the hearts and minds as well as the bodies of men. A reign established by means, not of material weapons, but of spiritual pretensions. It was founded not on force, but on falsehood and fraud. And the superstitious fears of the half-civilized and ignorant Gothic kingdoms. The popedom has always been eager to proclaim its own diversity from all other kingdoms. It claims, quote, a princedom more perfect than every human princedom surpassing them as far as the light of the sun exceeds that of the moon, unquote. It arrogates to itself a character as superior to secular kingdoms as man to the irrational beasts. Its laws are made not with the best human wisdom, but octorite, uh, 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 scientia at plentitude, that is, with the fullness of divine knowledge and the fullness of apostolic power. You'll have to pardon my Latin. I'm not a Roman. 
Now he says, is not the papacy sufficiently diverse from all the rest of the kingdoms of, the we- of Western Europe to identify it as the little horn? What other ruling monarch of Christendom ever pretended to apostolic authority or ruled men in the name of God? Does the Pope dress in royal robes? Nay, but in priestly garments. Does he wear a crown? Nay, but a triple tiara to show that he reigns in heaven and in earth and in hell. Does he wield a scepter? Nay, but a crozier or a crook to show that he is the good shepherd of the church. Does he? Does his subjects kiss his hand? Nay, but his toe. Verily, this power is diverse from the rest, but in great things and in little. It is small in size, gigantic in its pretensions. It is or was for centuries one among many temporal kingdoms of Europe. It is the only one which claims a spiritual authority and universal dominion. Number four its moral character. The salient feature here is, quote, the mouth speaking very great things, unquote. Great words spoken against the Most High, and, quote, a look more stout than his fellows, unquote. Audacious pride and bold blasphemy must characterize the power that fulfills this point of the symbol. We ask then, has the papacy exhibited this mark also? Time would fail me to quote to you verbatim its great words, its boastful self-glorifications, and its outrageous blasphemies against God. You'll find pages of them quoted in my work entitled The Approaching End of the Age, and volumes filled with them exist, for papal documents consist of little else. The papal claims are so grotesque in their pride and self-exaltation that they almost produce a sense of the comic. And that feeling of pity, conti- pitying contempt with which one would watch a frog trying to swell itself into the size of an ox. I must, however, mention some of the claims contained in these so-called great words, which will show you the nature of papal blasphemies. It is claimed, for instance, that, quote, no laws made contrary to the canons and decrees of the Roman prelates have any force, unquote. That, quote, the tribunals of all kings are subject to the priests, unquote. That, quote, no man may act against the discipline of the Roman church, unquote. That, quote, the papal decrees and decretal epistles are to be numbered among the canonical scriptures, unquote. And not only so, but that the scriptures themselves are to be received only, quote, because a judgment of holy Pope Innocent was published for receiving them, unquote. It is claimed that, quote, emperors ought to obey and not rule over pontiffs, that is, over popes, unquote. That even an an awfully wicked pope, who is a, quote, slave of hell, unquote, may not be rebuked by mortal man, because, quote, he is himself to judge all men, and to be judged by none, unquote. And, quote, since he was styled God by the pious prince Constantine, it is manifest that God cannot be judged by man, unquote. They claim that no laws, not even their own canon laws, can bind the popes, because that just as Christ, being maker of all laws and ordinances, could violate the law of the Sabbath, because he was Lord also of the Sabbath, so popes can dispense with any law to show that they are above all law. 
It is claimed that the chair of St. Peter, the seat of the Pope, the see of Rome is, quote, made the head of the world, unquote, that it is not to be subject to any man, quote, since by the divine mouth it is exalted above all, unquote. In the canon laws of the Roman, uh, uh, excuse me, in the canon laws, this is talking about Roman Catholic canon law, the supreme law of the church, in the canon laws, the Roman pontiff is described as, quote, our Lord God the Pope, unquote, and said to be, quote, neither God nor man, but both, unquote. That's what it says in Roman Catholic canon law. You see, God left us no room for error. Neither, we cannot be in error about who Jesus Christ is, nor can we be in error about who Antichrist is. The papacy so fully and completely fulfills the descriptions given in the Bible about Antichrist just as much as Christ fulfills all the prophecies in the Bible given about our Messiah. There's to be no confusion in God's house about either. We are to know who Christ is as as though we were one with him, and we are to be in equal understanding and determination about who the Antichrist is as we are about who our Savior is. God does not deal treacherously with his people. We've come to the end of the broadcast. I want to thank you all for listening. We'll continue in the next hour with discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> 